Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. Joe Biden, he's been president now for a week and he's continuing to issue a flurry of executive orders dealing with everything from COVID to racial equality to climate change to the topic that we'll be discussing today, which is immigration. Now we're going to spend a chunk of our program on that single issue as you continue to do a deep dive into the policies President Biden's going to be focusing on during his first crucial 100 days. But before we get to that, let's start with the choice that I believe is now facing the Republican Party and primarily Republican leadership. What they can do is take door number one, continuing based Donald Trump, the anti-democratic election overturning insurrection that he led and go down the crazy train, or they can dump him like the pariah he's become. And I give you a hint here, guess which direction the grand old party seems to be heading. And for that, let's bring in Andrew Whitman. Um, Andrew, I, I was given at least a, a deek about a week ago um, that, you know, there were, you know, McConnell and McCarthy were going in one direction, but I shouldn't have bought the fake. You know, you're not the only one, Rich. Republican members in both the House and the Senate may also have been thrown off by that deke, if you will. Remember that Republican leadership in both the House and Senate told their members that any vote on impeachment was a vote of conscience. Vote the way you feel without pressure or penalty. In the House, it was the number three Republican, Liz Cheney, who gave those marching orders, and non-Republicans followed her, voting to impeach Trump for a second time. But now some in the party are targeting her. She's already got a primary challenger back in Wyoming ahead of next year's midterms. And now Florida Congressman and mini Trump wannabe Matt Gates is piling on. He's going to Cheyenne tomorrow, holding a rally calling for Cheney's removal from House leadership. Mitch McConnell has faced threats in the Senate as well. Some unnamed Republicans saying there would be a push to boot McConnell as GOP leader if he votes to convict Trump at the impeachment trial. They're turning on everyone critical of Trump in their party. Meanwhile, Republicans are closing ranks and protecting members whose connection to the insurrection seem impossible to ignore. People like Congressman Mo Brooks. Today is the day American patriots start taking down names and kicking ass. So I have a question for you. Will you fight for America? Oh, they fought. Also under GOP protection, Arizona Congressman Paul Gosar and Andy Biggs, both of whom were named as helpers by the organizer of the January 6th riot, who may have given rioters tours of the Capitol before it happened, and who were so guilty in their own minds that they tried for and failed to get pardons from Trump before Trump hightailed it to Florida. And then there's Marjorie Taylor Greene, who has developed her own special brand of crazy. The Florida, oh, sorry, the Georgia freshman and QAnon advocate, before she was elected to Congress, liked a Facebook comment saying, quote, a bullet to the head would be quicker to remove House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. On another QAnon Facebook post, she called the Parkland school massacre a false flagged plan shooting. And in a video she posted, Green harassed Parkland survivor and advocate David Hogg about gun policy and the access he was getting with lawmakers. The stupidity of her comments in this clip is breathtaking. How did you get kids? Why do you use kids? Why kids? You know, if school, if school zones were protected by, with security guards with guns, there would be no mass shootings at schools. Do you know that? My kids, he's a high school kid. By the way, Green was just rewarded by the GOP. She's now been appointed to serve on the House Education and Labor Committee. Education, I'll leave it there. Yet there's no Republican push to oust Green or Brooks or Gosar or Biggs or anyone. And part of the problem is that the Republican leaders who know better refuse to act that way. Take this before and after from Kevin McCarthy. The president bears responsibility for Wednesday's attack on Congress by mob rioters. Everybody across this country has some responsibility. Quite a turnaround in two weeks, and now McCarthy is heading to Mar-a-Lago to visit Donald Trump tomorrow. Combine that with what we've heard from the top, from two top Republicans in the Senate, Mitch McConnell's actions did not match these words. The last time the Senate convened, we had just reclaimed the Capitol from violent criminals who tried to stop Congress from doing our duty. The mob was fed lies. They were provoked by the president and other powerful people. Maybe, but McConnell voted yesterday unsuccessfully to cancel the Trump impeachment trial. And then there's the ultimate spineless senator, Lindsey Graham. Uh, Trump and I, we've had a hell of a journey. I hate it being this way. Oh my God, I hate it. From my point of view, he's been a consequential president. But today, 
First thing you'll see. All I can say is uh, count me out. Enough is enough. He also voted against the impeachment trial yesterday. Rick. And is threatened, by the way, that uh, if they even tried call witnesses, um, he's going to hold the trial up for weeks, if not months. Way to go, Lindsay. All right, Andrew, thank you. I want to bring in my first guest, Olivia Troy. She was Mike Pence's Homeland Security Advisor until she left the White House weeks before the riots and became an outspoken critic of her boss, his boss, I should say, President Trump. Now, Olivia is forming a group called the Republican Accountability Project, which is being put together to fight Trumpism. Olivia, it's good talking to you again. Uh, listen, um, whether people like him or not, uh, you got to respect McConnell in that often it seems he's playing chess when some of the Democratic leadership is playing um, checkers. Uh, to that end, I really thought when he dropped the marker and he went to the floor of the Senate and pointed the finger directly at Trump for what happened on the 6th, legitimized the election, said all the other nonsense was just that, I thought he did the math and said, all right, this is what we break from Trump, that Trump gave an opportunity to try and get his party back. I don't get what even to a degree McCarthy's doing, running to Florida now, backtracking on condemning Trump, McConnell trying to find a way out here from having a vote for all of this. There was a chance that the president handed them, God knows, um, with the riot, for them to have a break. And it seems they're still throwing their arms around him. And, and I just think it's a misplay. Forget the morality of it all. Just even raw politics. I don't get why they're doing it. Do you? No, I completely agree with you. I think that they had the opportunity. McConnell had the opportunity to break away and pull the party back to some form of acceptability or conservatism that is actually more traditional in Republican circles. And instead, I guess he reassessed. And, you know, now that we're further out from the January 6th heat of the moment, I guess he's decided that he's going to continue to side with Trump, which is just appalling. And it was, he is, you know, he's been a leader in Congress for several years now. The party rallies around him. And I just can't believe that he threw in the towel and said, you know, I'm just going to fall back in line and I'm going to continue to pander to the former president. Listen, you were one of the first uh, voices who weren't just going through back channels. You went public that you saw some really dangerous rhetoric emerging. This was well prior to January 6th. And you said, uh, you found my line. I got to have a break. Your old boss was being threatened to be strung up. I, I mean, I don't get how much more seriously you have to take it. And it's a perfect analogy to where, how quickly they forget, Marjorie Greene literally is talking or at least liking posts about assassinating the speaker all other nonsense I don't even have time to reiterate right now and she's being put on the education committee I mean why isn't it in the best interest of the Republican Party to say the last four years and what happened not only in the election but also what happened in Georgia subsequently should be a warning that we got to step back but yet they seem to still allow those folks, the Mo Brookses and the others, you know, to have a seat at the table. I, again, I'm trying not to be Pollyannish here. I'm just trying to do from a raw political standpoint, this is not in a national party's best interest, especially if they want to win on the national level again. Absolutely. And the issue is it's not only not in the party's interest, it's not in the interest of what of the greater good for our country, right, and for the security and the betterment of Americans. And we are walking a very dangerous line here. And so I think the Republican Party is saying, uh, all of these Republicans that are standing by, except for the few that have taken a stand against us, are saying that their, their, their future is the party of the QAnon conspirators. They're not going to take a stand. If these Republicans don't actually push back on these individuals, they're leading the general public down a dangerous road and path, right? Because they're listening. They need to hear it from Republicans. They need to hear it from Republicans themselves that this was a legitimate election. And right now, you have a large population out there who believes that the election was still stolen, and they are continuing to hear these individuals and their lies. Listen, you made um, your career in Homeland Security and counterterrorism. And 
your boss, uh, who I know you had, your old boss, who you had great affection for, literally, he was the subject of a terror target. Um, I'm curious, do you believe down deep, um, Mike Pence believes that the party that he grew up in isn't willing to hold the people to account, the law and order party of the Republicans, um, to not just what happened, but also that by not, you know, cracking down on these folks, they're abandoning him too and his family who were there that day. They're certainly abandoning the party that he has stood for for many years now, right? And, and so I think in terms of Mike Pence, while I can't, you know, completely guess what must be running through his mind, I think we're going to learn a lot about where he's going to stand moving forward, especially if he starts to make a run for the presidency in 2024. I, is he going to say that it's okay that a sitting president, his boss, called basically for the assassination of him, for the wanting him to overturn our election? I mean, how is that okay? How do you how do you reconcile that moving forward, right? You know, finally, uh, you've seen this, and you probably have more uh, information than, than we do, but uh, top officials are worried uh, that there will be domestic terror attacks potentially in the coming weeks. The actions that Congress, and when I say Congress, I mean both parties, um, what they do and what they choose not to do, we could be looking at a different light here uh, in the coming weeks, God forbid, if there are more attacks. They looked and they were incentivized, apparently, if you believe the intel, by what happened on January 6th. They didn't see it as a giant defeat. Um, do you think that lawmakers, particularly Republicans who are giving Trump cover, do they realize the danger they're playing with if they do not condemn full-throatedly what these fringe groups are saying and doing? I don't know how much more obvious it can be given what they, you know, firsthand lived on January 6th. And the people who were there at the U.S. Capitol, who stormed the U.S. Capitol, were there because they thought that they were doing their duty to stand up for their country and the lies that they had been fed. And so if you're a Republican that's still going along with this, you are enabling this dangerous movement that has taken a hold across our country. You're allowing the opportunity and you're not calling it out you're not calling out these groups who now are being told that it's okay. And I am all, I'm very concerned about future violence happening because they're being told, you know, the people who they look up to aren't being held accountable and the people who are the guardrails supposedly are also not holding them accountable. Olivia, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And again, she was the Homeland Security and the anti-terror advisor for Mike Pence up until just a few months ago. All right, Andrew, for people who think this is some parlor game in D.C., what happens in Washington doesn't stay in Washington. The crazy is at the state levels, and it's been codified by state Republican parties. And in scary ways. In Oregon, they, the, the Republican Party of Oregon just labeled the attack on the Capitol a false flag, a staged event to try to make the party and, and Trump look bad. Uh, Republican officials, longtime officials in Pennsylvania, say they don't know the party anymore. Uh, the, especially their moderates who came from suburban areas no longer have a voice, and so the whole party is turning into a Trump frothy mix. And then you get into Arizona where they just censured Cindy McCain, uh, Jeff Flake, a former senator, and their current governor, Doug Ducey, because they wouldn't overturn the election results. There was a Republican chairperson in Hawaii who posted positive QAnon messages. She was forced to resign. Oh, some of them have claimed 9-11 was, uh, you know, a false event, mm -hmm. the false flag, there were child actors well, or that's... stage ones at Sandy Hook, and, and it goes on that's and on. That's Marjorie Greene. Exactly. Speaking of Marjorie Greene, again, we're talking about this congresswoman that you'd never heard of, but to me, it's not about her. Andrew, you went through the horrific stuff that she said, not just after what happened at Marjorie Stoneman High School, but about Sandy Hook, mm -hmm. about, you know, advocating not once but twice, and not 20 years ago, just the last year or two, assassinating the Speaker of the House in any HR department in America, she would be told to turn over a key card today. She'd be fired. But she's been promoted to a real committee in the House, and McCarthy knew it, and he did it. 
She didn't get wrapped on the knuckles for this. She got rewarded. And she's not really an outlier. I mean, this stuff wasn't out in public, you know, these posts when she was elected back in November, but they certainly, voters in her district knew she was QAnon. They knew who she was. They knew what she was. They elected her anyway. It's not, it's not a problem for them. It's kind of a feature of the whole thing. And I think we're going to see more people like this Listen, by Republicans. moderates are being driven out of the Republican Party. Um, and while you could say if you support Biden or Democrats, well, good, you know, that, that's going to further marginalize. We need two healthy parties in this country. Um, I, I, it's not healthy for a republic to have only one option when you go to the ballot box. But McConnell and McCarthy, by giving in, are making the choice easier and easier. All right, when we come back, everyone, we will continue our series about the president's first 100 days. I'm talking about Biden. That's right. We have a new one. And today we are focusing on the topic of immigration. I'm going to be speaking with the ACLU attorney who is leading the fight to reunite families that the Trump administration split up at the border. And then we'll be joined by a Democratic congressman from California to talk about how Congress plans to handle all the things that Biden wants to do.